Canadians love their debit cards. In fact, it's our electronic payment method of choice. We rank among the top five countries in the world in terms of debit usage. In 2011 alone, we made 4.1 billion debit transactions, representing $183 billion worth of payments. Canada's domestic debit network has evolved from a small network of automated bank machines, or ABMs, run by a few select financial institutions, to a convenient and thriving national payment network supported by the operations of the Canadian Payments Association, the CPA. But Canada's debit marketplace isn't limited to card-based transactions. Innovation in payments has resulted in the development of a multitude of new debit products, as well as online payment channels, sparking the creation of new CPA rules to support their use in Canada. Debit-based transactions at an ABM or in a store are called point-of-service, or POS, payments. They can be either debits, used for payment from an account held at the financial institution or FI that issue the customer's debit card or other debit device, or credits, used for refunds to the account from which the payment was made. Online payments are individual transactions made over the Internet. Customers can initiate an online payment from their FI account to a merchant. Using an electronic device such as a laptop or mobile phone, they visit a merchant's website, make a purchase, and choose to use the online payment service offered on the website. You've probably heard this type of payment referred to as Interact Online. Merchants can initiate online payment refunds. These transactions are used to credit a customer's FI account for a customer refund or merchandise return. Payments made by credit cards or closed-loop third-party systems like retailers' gift cards are outside of the purview of the CPA and our rules do not apply to them. In this module, we'll examine the role of the CPA, how we interact with the Canadian debit industry, how POS and online payments travel, and the CPA rules that apply. The CPA plays a leadership role in Canada's financial system by providing safe and efficient clearing and settlement systems that enable member FIs to meet the payment needs of Canadians. So what is clearing and settlement exactly? Clearing means the reconciliation of all the payment items exchanged between FIs each business day and figuring out the amounts owing to and by them. Settlement means the payment of the clearing balances. Our Automated Clearing Settlement System, the ACSS, tracks the volume and value of retail payments, including POS and online payments, that are exchanged between Canadian member FIs each business day. The ACSS also calculates the net amounts owing between all the major financial institutions at the end of each business day and their net position overall. This is done in preparation for settlement at the Bank of Canada, which involves payments made via CPA's Large Value Transfer System, the LVTS. In managing our systems and related operations, we establish a common framework of rules and standards that govern the daily exchange of payment items between CPA member FIs and outline operational procedures. In addition to promoting the efficiency, safety, and soundness of our clearing and settlement systems, we also have a public policy mandate to take into account the interests of users. Through a network of committees representing our member financial institutions and stakeholders, we interact with other payment schemes operating in the Canadian market, investigate emerging payment technologies, facilitate the interaction of CPA systems with others involved in the exchange, clearing and settlement of payments, and facilitate the development of new payment methods and technologies. To learn more about the CPA, what we do, and how we do it, you can check out the Intro to the CPA module in this series or visit the CPA website About section. The CPA has two rules which apply to in-person transactions at the point of service. One addresses payments where a card and a personal identification number, or PIN, are both required, and the other addresses transactions where the payment device, such as a debit card or key fob, doesn't require a PIN. First, let's examine Rule E1, which sets out the requirements for PIN-based POS payments. These transactions are initiated at a bank machine or using a merchant's POS device. They can be either debits or credits. 
Pin-based POS debits are initiated by an individual to pay for goods or services or to obtain cash at an ABM. They result in a debit to a cardholder's account. Pin-based POS credit transactions are initiated by a merchant to credit the cardholder's account in the case of purchase returns or refunds. The key requirement for pin-based POS payments is two-factor authentication. Both an FI-issued debit card and a PIN are required for a transaction to proceed. These payments are made in real time, authorized immediately over a network connection, and once approved, are final. Customer protection is a key element of this rule. When making a PIN-based POS payment, the customer must be provided with the ability to make corrections while entering instructions, the opportunity to review and verify the transaction amount before they authorize it, and the ability to cancel the transaction at any point prior to payment authorization. Next, let's examine Rule E4, which governs pinless POS payments, which can also be debits or credits. Pinless POS debits originate in a face-to-face -face environment when a payor uses a CPA member-issued payment device, such as a bank card or key fob, to pay for goods or services. Pinless POS credits are used by merchants for customer refunds or merchandise returns. Rule E4 also addresses the procedures that apply if an inquiry or complaint is raised by a payor regarding whether a transaction was duly authorized. The key element of this framework is that it upholds the key principles of consumer protection, safety, and authentication while eliminating the requirement to enter a PIN. This further reduces inconveniences such as waiting in ABM and store lines. Now, let's take a look at the requirements for online payments, which are governed by Rule E2. These are made over the Internet. Online payments are initiated by a customer. While visiting a merchant's website, the customer orders goods or services and chooses to pay using the merchant's online payment service. During the payment process, a connection is established to the customer's online banking interface. This allows the customer to authenticate their identity by signing in and gives them the opportunity to review and authorize the payment transaction. An online payment is essentially an order from the customer to their FI to send a payment from their account to the merchant's account. Online payment refunds can be initiated by a merchant to credit a customer's account in the case of refunds or merchandise returns. Rule E2 sets out key safeguards to protect all parties involved in online payment transactions. It protects merchants by supporting a good funds model, which means that once an online payment transaction is completed, the customer cannot reverse the transaction within the service. Financial institutions can't subsequently dishonor or return an online payment transaction via the CPA's clearing system either. To protect the consumers, FIs have agreed to apply the principles of the Canadian government's Code of Conduct for the Credit and Debit Card Industry to online payments. Rule E2 enables Interact's online payment service and is an excellent example of the way CPA works with the payments industry and stakeholders to facilitate the introduction of new payment offerings. The CPA has also issued certain guidelines for pre-funded debit products permissible under the CPA's Payable Through Policy. In broad terms, payable through arrangements are those in which a CPA member plays the role of an intermediary and does not have a direct relationship with the end user of the debit card or device. The funds by which payments are made are held or managed by a non-CPA member who makes the pay-no-pay -pay decision for payment authorization. Products permissible under the CPA's payable through policy include certain distinct open-loop pre-funded card programs, Many of these are available in the Canadian market, such as certain payroll programs, travel card programs, and health care and benefit cards. Many of these products are backed by a network brand and can be used anywhere that network is available, in the same manner as traditional debit cards. Some open-loop pre-funded cards also allow cardholders to get cash back as part of a retail purchase and to withdraw cash from automated banking machines, ABMs, in participating networks. It's important to know that the CPA supports evolution in Canada's debit marketplace. To help explain how our rules and policies work, we've named specific products and scheme operators, such as Interac. But we take a device-neutral approach in the development of our policies, rules, and standards. This leaves the door open for financial institutions to establish relationships with new payment scheme operators and offer new products and services to their clients.
All CPA rules, as well as the guidelines for pre-funded debit products permissible under the CPA's payable through policy, are publicly available on the CPA website, www.cdnpay.ca. Let's look at an in-store debit card purchase to explain the basic flow of a PIN-based POS debit transaction. We'll explain the technical terms as we follow the payment's journey. Say hello to Suzanne. She forgot to bring her lunch to work on Friday. She heads over to the deli and pays for a sandwich using her Interact debit card. To initiate the POS transaction, the merchant, in this case the deli, must offer FI-issued debit as a payment method. In this scenario, the deli is also an acquirer since they acquire or capture transaction data from the POS device. This transaction data is sent to the deli's FI to reconcile the deli's payments. Once the deli tallies up Suzanne's purchase, the counter clerk enters the purchase data into the POS device. A connection service provider routes the payment request in real time over an online POS network to the POS scheme operator. Scheme operators are national payment networks like Interac, which allow customers to pay for goods and services or access their funds through ABMs and POS terminals across Canada. The Exchange Network is another, smaller, Canadian POS scheme operator. It interconnects approximately 2,300 ABMs operated by some of Canada's smaller banks and the majority of credit unions. The scheme operator, in this case Interac, recognizes Suzanne's FI by the information captured by the POS device. On behalf of Interac, a connection service provider routes the payment request to Suzanne's FI. Suzanne further authenticates herself by entering her personal identification number, or PIN. She also enters additional details of the transaction, for example, whether to pay from her checking or savings account, and authorizes the transaction. Suzanne's FI approves or declines the payment request and, via connection service provider, sends this information to Interac. Interac sends an approved or declined message, via a connection service provider, back to the POS device at the deli so that Suzanne and the counter clerk know whether the payment was approved or declined. The transaction information generated by the deli's POS device will be provided to the deli's FI, who will use it to reconcile the payment and collect the funds from Suzanne's FI through the process known as clearing and settlement. In a pinless POS transaction, a personal identification number, or PIN, is not required. The pinless debit device, which securely stores information, interacts intelligently with a merchant's contactless terminal to validate the device and approve or decline the transaction. Every day, George stops at the drive through on his way to work to buy a cup of coffee and a bagel. You see, George is a creature of habit. He pays with his contactless debit card, which results in a debit to George's account at his FI. When George reaches the pickup window at the drive through the clerk hands him a device reader, or terminal, that is equipped to accept contactless payments. When George waves his contactless debit card in front of the device reader, the card and the device exchange information via a tiny antenna built into the card. First, the terminal validates the card, ensuring, for example, that it has not been altered since it was issued by George's FI. Next, the terminal executes payment authorization. During this process, the terminal uses information stored in the contactless debit card to review and assess the value of the purchase against any transaction limits that George's FI has put in place for his contactless purchases. Since George's purchase meets the requirements of his FI and the requirements of the payment scheme, in this case Interact Flash, the terminal accepts the transaction and notifies George and the clerk that the payment has been approved. If the requirements were not met, the transaction would be declined. Since the payment is approved, transaction information is generated by the merchant's terminal and the details are stored by the coffee shop, which, in technical terms, is the merchant acquirer in the transaction. This transaction information will be provided to the coffee shop's FI, who will later use it to reconcile the payment and collect the funds from George's FI through the process known as clearing and settlement.
Online payments also have strict requirements for authentication and authorization, but are quite different from POS payments, since the entire transaction takes place online. Online payments don't require the use of a PIN to verify the identity of the payor. Instead, they involve validation of the payment application and authorization of the transaction. First, a customer visits a merchant's website, orders a product or service, and chooses to pay for it with funds from their FI account using the online payment option, such as Interact Online. Next, the customer identifies his or her financial institution and is securely transferred by the payment application to the FI's online banking site, where the customer signs in. Then, the customer's FI obtains the customer's authorization for the transaction. The customer's financial institution sends a message to the merchant and the customer advising whether the transaction was successful. If successful, the transaction will result in a payment to the merchant's account. The transaction data will be provided to the merchant's FI. Later, the merchant's FI will use this data to reconcile the payment and collect the funds owing from the customer's FI during clearing and settlement. FIs exchange many different types of payments each day. On average, some 25 million payment items representing approximately $174.5 billion in transactions were cleared and settled through the CPA's systems each business day during 2012. As each day's exchanges come to a close, FIs need to reconcile these payments and determine the amounts they owe each other as a result. This process is called clearing, and it's managed by the CPA. Our systems calculate the total volume and value of inter-FI exchanges for all of the payment types we manage and determine the amounts owing to and by each FI as a result of each day's activity. FIs need to ensure that aggregate volume and value figures for any retail payments they've exchanged with other FIs that day, including POS and online payments, are entered into the CPA's Automated Clearing Settlement System, the ACSS for Clearing. To do this, they enter the figures into a specific payment stream. The ACSS has many different payment streams, each one representing a particular type of payment. There are dedicated payment streams in the ACSS for POS debits, POS credits, online payments, and online payment refunds. With over 15,000 financial institution branches spread across Canada, you can imagine how challenging this process would be if each branch made its own individual entries into the ACSS. To streamline the process, the ACSS functions as a tiered system. A small number of FIs function as direct clearers. Direct clearers, which also include group clearers who make ACSS entries on behalf of credit unions, are the only FIs that are allowed to make entries directly into the ACSS. The direct clearer that is owed funds as a result of a payment exchange makes the entry into the system. Direct clearers make these entries on their own behalf and can also act as clearing agents. Clearing agents make entries into the ACSS on behalf of other financial institutions that are not direct clearers. The FIs that use the services of a clearing agent are referred to as indirect clearers. This tiered system keeps the number of ACSS entries to a minimum and enhances the efficiency of the ACSS. Let's take a simplified look at how clearing works using POS debits as an example. POS debits are exchanged via Interact and the Exchange Network throughout the day. At 9 p.m., reports are generated by direct clearers for the purpose of making ACSS entries. These reports reflect all of the transaction information that has been captured or acquired by POS terminals prior to 9 p.m., which is the exchange cutoff for POS transactions authorized that business day. Based on these reports, Direct Clear B knows the total volume of its clients' POS payments that involve clients of Direct Clear A, as well as the total amount of funds that Direct Clear A owes them as a result. Direct Clear B will make an entry into the POS debit stream of the ACSS system to indicate the total amount that FIA owes them and the total number of transactions that this amount represents. ACSS entries are made by each direct clear against each other direct clear that owes them funds for each type of payments that have been exchanged that day.
So we know that aggregate volume and value data is entered into ACSS streams by each direct clearer that is owed funds as a result of payment exchanges. What happens next in the clearing? A process called netting. At the end of the daily exchange process, ACSS entries, including those for POS and online payments, are used to determine the net positions of the direct clearers. Netting is the process of establishing the amount owed to each FI by adjusting the mutual claims of each one on the other. The ACSS determines the amounts owing between each pair of direct clearers, a process known as bilateral netting. The system also determines the net positions of each FI overall. This process is referred to as multilateral netting. The multilateral net position of each direct clearer is called its clearing balance. Settlement at the Bank of Canada is the next and final step in the clearing and settlement process. It takes place following the end of an ACSS cycle around 11 a.m. each business day. Direct clearers that have a negative ACSS clearing balance are required to send payments for that amount to the Bank of Canada using the CPA's Large Value Transfer System, or LVTS. When the Bank of Canada receives a settlement payment from a direct clearer, it updates that direct clearer's ACSS settlement account records to reflect the payment. Direct clearers with a positive ACSS clearing balance can choose to maintain a positive balance in their ACSS settlement account or reduce the balance by receiving an offsetting LVTS payment from the Bank of Canada. Settlement on the books of the Bank of Canada is final or irrevocable in payment speak. In turn, indirect clearers settle with their respective clearing agents through accounts they maintain with them. For more detailed information on the CPA's role in clearing and settlement, check out our Intro to the CPA session. The CPA supports financial institutions and stakeholders in many ways. We engage with the industry on multiple levels and play a leadership role on several domestic and international payment forums. We regularly consult with member FIs and their customers, businesses, governments, and consumer groups to ensure that their opinions are heard and considered during the development of our policies, rules, and standards. We also provide support to a network of committees representing our member financial institutions and stakeholders through which we obtain input or advice on the various activities and initiatives we undertake. This engagement and outreach help us ensure that Canada's clearing and settlement systems continue to evolve to meet the needs of Canadians. In addition to these responsibilities, we also play an active role in incident management. Member FIs experiencing emergency situations that could delay their clearing operations can reach out to the CPA to inform other CPA members that the FI is experiencing problems that might prevent it from meeting deadlines. These situations could include technical difficulties processing payments or localized network outages, for example. Sometimes the problems can be resolved before a deadline, in which case all is well. Other times, the FI might not be able to meet a clearing deadline as a result of the issue. In these cases, the CPA can facilitate an extension to the deadline for that particular FI, and the other members will cooperate to accommodate the situation. We hope you've enjoyed this session and that you've learned a few things you didn't know about POS and online payments. If you'd like to learn more, please visit the CPA website Act and Rules section, where you can find the ACSS rules we discussed today. Our guidelines for pre-funded debit products permissible under the CPA's Payable Through Policy are also available on the CPA website, along with the answers to many frequently asked questions. If you have a question on POS or online payments we haven't addressed in this session or in the FAQ section of our website, please feel free to contact us and we'll be happy to provide you with the information you need. You can reach us by email at info at cdnpay.ca or by phone at 613-238-4173.